All right, how's it going, everybody? My name is Helmi. Welcome to episode seven of the Creator Video Podcast. Today, I have a very special guest, a very famous finance YouTuber here in Malaysia. His name is Ziet Invest. So he has a really large YouTube channel following, about 40,000? Yeah, 40 plus. Okay, so, and he just recently quit his job to do this full time. So he's practicing exactly what I usually preach online. Can you quickly introduce yourself? Yep, thank you, Helmi. Thank you for inviting me to this podcast. Hi, everyone. My name is Ziet. So I run a YouTube channel, Ziet Invest, uh, with over 40,000 subscribers. Basically, I do content on investing in the U.S. stock market from a Malaysian, from a non-U.S. residence kind of perspective. So I have several social media platforms. Instagram is about 7,000. Twitter about 2,000, so and so forth. So all in all, it's about 50,000 followers. So yeah, really happy to be here today. Great. So your largest would probably be YouTube. YouTube right? Yeah. All right. Okay, cool. What do you study in school? So this is the funny part. I'm actually a mechanical engineer by profession. So studied four years degree in mechanical engineering, graduated. Luckily, my scholar company, they had this engineering department where they develop power plants, YTL power, right? So I had the opportunity to join the commercial team. So there on, I actually did not practice as much engineering. So I joined into the financial world, learned about the commercial stuff, really learning from zero. I don't even know what is a financial statement. I don't even know what is a stock. I don't even know what is investing because starting from young, stocks and everything like this, right? It seems like gamble to me and my family. So we were not very savvy with money, but because of the skills that I've learned from my job, I get to like really apply that towards my personal life as well, learning how to invest, learning how to manage my money, etc. Yeah, that's how I got into the finance world. And then it all just slowly trickled down to this finance content creation kind of space. So when did you start doing this content? Like what sparked the, the whole content thing? Like where did you start? What did you do? And what happened? Something must trigger you. What happened? Yeah, for sure. So I always wanted to create content online. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I know back then I was a pretty good gamer. I was actually like part of the top 40 teams in Dota 2 pretty all right above average kind of gamer so i wanted to create like a playing kind of games commentary kind of videos online but then slowly i realized that i'm kind of an introvert it's hard to do those kind of videos without really like those personality those flares that you can naturally just speak in front of the camera kind of you know make people laugh kind of humor so i, I slowly I, I killed that idea and then i started to tinker for a good year of what i wanted to do what am i good at i'm really not good at anything else not expert in anything so Slowly, when that idea came to fruition, it was during, uh, I think, second year into my job when I was doing all this finance stuff, my friends started to realize that, hey, actually, I know about financial statements. I know a little bit about finance and stuff, right? So my friends started to ask me, Zid, how about you teach me certain basic stuff about finance because they are running their business. So I thought like, hey, one person is asking. Another friend is also asking. So it slowly trickled to three to four friends asking the same questions. And I realized, hey, it's actually very basic stuff, financial statements. If you just study for like one or two months, you can pretty much get the hang of it, right? Yeah, so that gave me, uh, sparked me the idea that also alongside, I was still eager to create content. So I was watching people like Ali Abdal, Matt Diavela, this kind of person, right? So one of the things that Ali Abdal showed the book was Show Your Work by Austin Cleon. Basically, he said that you just have to journal your journey online. You don't have to be an expert. Whatever you do, just show it. Your tweet one day is a tweet, but over the course of three to four years, tweets could be a chapter, could be a book, right? So I applied the same principle towards YouTube and then just started sharing my journey, what I've learned, what are my mistakes right now, what have I taught people, all the basic stuff. I think people can relate. So slowly that turned into 15, 30, 50 subscribers and it just snowballed from there. Wow, that's very awesome. So did you buy anybody's course to become a content creator? Nil, zero. Everything I learned for free online. I think the online is really, online university, the YouTube university is really where you can learn a lot of things. Like I still remember I watched your videos before on a little bit on finance stuff and also, you know, back then. So I the, started first or you started first? You started first, bro. Oh, wow. So you were, you were like the, I don't know. That time I was still watching like what Balcony Hijau, right? Your, your past YouTube kind of content. So that time I had zero subscribers. I was just still learning stuff. So I saw like Mr. Money TV, Su Yin, you yourself. And also that time was like what Graham Stephan, these kind of people right online in the US, YouTube finance kind of thing. So yeah, that was how everything really started. Okay, so it's very impressive how you have grown over the years. I think ultimately we want followers and stuff, which you kind of already have. But how do you make money? Can you share like how do you make money from your, your content? Sure. I mean, currently I, I run this YouTube thing as a little business. So I would say very directly what I'm doing right now, it's earning me in terms of affiliate income. So basically 
when a broker or really any sponsor wants to advertise their products, I provide a platform for them because their target audience is basically my viewers. Because my viewers are basically people that probably wanted to learn how to invest or probably like still very new to the in investing or finance world in general. Like. So they wanted to get better at their wealth growing journey. So I think sponsors that really wanted to reach out to these certain kind of people, they really have the money to splurge on it, right? I mean, they can put on billboard, they can put on news, they can do newsletter, they can do whatever they can. But then I think in this uh, internet era, like KOLs, this kind of uh, media, it's a really good medium for them to directly reach out to the audience because the results are all there. The views are all there, the retention rate are all there, the likes, the comments are all there. You, you can't like one. So as compared to the billboard, I think they would rather like come to KOLs like us to like really advertise their products. Yeah. So it's mostly the biggest chunk of your income. Is it like advertising or is it affiliate marketing? So I would say probably 80 to 90% affiliate income. The rest are probably a little bit uh, here and there when it comes to the income, uh, a bit on advertising. YouTube ads, really, it's very minute because the CPM, the cost per minute in Malaysia is very low, especially in such a small market and it's finance. In traditional, finance is usually higher. In the US, they can go like, what, $20 per CPM, right? But then in Malaysia, the CPM is probably $2.50 or $2. So it's very low. Technically, you can't really lift off on that YouTube ads itself. So you have to be a little bit creative when it comes to looking for sponsors, like really monetizing your stuff, but without crossing the line of too monetizing, where you don't give enough value and you keep asking for value. So I think that's a fine line not to be crossed by, I would say, myself and a lot of creators. Okay, I'm kind of interested with your collaboration. So how did you get your first client that, I don't know, did you approach them? Did they approach you? Who, uh, what happened? Like what kind of thing that they asked for? So no, that's a very good question. When I started the entire YouTube thing, I wasn't thinking about monetizing it at all. So I knew at that time when I created the channel, the immediate monetization path would be 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 watch hours, right? So in average, people take about one and a half years to get there. So I was ready to slog on for one or two years, kind of really just grind, get the 1,000 subscribers, get the 4,000 watch hours. So that was the only monetization path that I was thinking of. But yeah, I was literally just sharing whatever I loved. I was making really videos on the platforms that I use myself. I was making about six to seven videos on interactive brokers itself without them asking. I haven't talked to them before. And I think because of that, they started to see potential in me. And people are really kind of looking up to me, especially in Malaysia, uh, when it comes to interactive brokers themselves or just brokerage stuff in, in general. Hold up. What is an interactive broker? So yeah, sorry. So Interactive Brokers is one of the largest financial brokers in the world. So basically, if you want to buy stocks in the US, you can just tr you can travel to the US to buy it. But an easier way is through an agent. So Interactive Brokers is one of the public listed agents. So they are big institutionals, like a bank. Basically, they're a bank. So you put $500 into it, you want to buy your Apple stock, your Google stock. You can do it through them. And same goes to your Maybank. If you want to put money into fixed deposits, you put money into Maybank, right? So that's what Interactive Brokers is. Basically, they are like a bank. So it's like eToro and all that? Correct, correct. But they are much more regulated. They have more licenses worldwide and they also are public listed as compared to eToro. It's okay, to continue. sorry, let's, let's go back. Your first client, like how did you get your first sponsorship? Like how did they approach you? Did you approach them? Yeah, so we were talking about Interactive Brokers. So they saw the potential in me, really. I didn't even approach them. I didn't even ask them. They, they were like, oh, yo, Zit, literally an email, right? The largest broker in the world, especially in the international kind of scene. Just, just approached my email. That time I was one and a half K in terms of subscribers and really the views are mediocre, one to two K views kind of videos on a monthly basis, right? So they realized that I really like their product and I would fit very well to be sort of not ambassador, but really someone on the retail space that shares how they use the product, how I liked it, how I hated it, what's the problem, what's the concerns, really just highlight everything. And which is why today I'm still working with them because they are so open and they are not nitpicking and they are not reviewing the stuff that I'm talking online. They are really open and honest about their products. They want, they want the best for the clients. So that was how we started working. And uh, it started from a very little sponsorship on, you know, whatever clients I can bring to them through affiliate link, right? So there's a conversion, etc. And then it's over the time, over the course of, I think two years right now, they saw the potential in me and slowly increasing my commission rate for everything. So yeah, it snowballed from there. Okay, so big news. You just told me that you just quit your job recently, your full-time job to do this content creation thing full-time. I think that's bravo. Thank you. It's something that I also want to do. A lot of people also want to 
have the option at least should they continue in their full-time job or just do this content creation thing but, but people want that option so you've actually the man living the dream so can you tell us a little bit about that what's going on first of all thank you indeed it is a dream come true it's a dream that i i foresee it already and wanted it to happen and really make it happen i mean i don't know if it's co coincidence or not but it took full exact 36 months of from zero subscribers towards the day of resonation three years 36 months so yeah, whatever I can say is 36 months sounds long, but it's not very long. But actually, it was full of really pain, slaughter, grind. I gave myself no space, really go through depression, go through the grind. Sometimes I cried, sometimes I broke down, really learning every single aspect of how to get, how to be a better content creator from creating thumbnails, writing titles, from SEO, from idea research, from really understanding what the people want talking to people, interacting with audience, replying every single comment, asking what they want, really just improving the lighting, the audio, the framing. Yeah, I started from, a, I think, a small 150 square foot bedroom. I was stacking my little Canon M50 camera on my books. And then I think after four to five months, I realized that my salary back then was like, I don't know what, 3,500 3, ringgit per month. And then I was like, okay, now that I got 3.54K kind of salary, you know what? I will just go and rent a bigger room. It's about 300 square feet or 250 square feet. Also a very small room. But it's slightly larger enough that I can fit all my lightings, all my cameras, etc. But I still have to move around every time I want to film and etc. I still have to set up. So from that onwards, I knew the passion was there. The drive was there. And I would say gratefully enough, COVID hit. I know it's, it's a bad thing for a lot of people, but COVID was like the golden push for like an online content creator and for me as well, right? So people were stuck at home. There was no choice but to, you know, serve everything online. People had extra cash. People wasn't spending. People wanted to invest. So that was like an added boost, which was right. unexpected. Right. So at that time, I was about three to four months into my YouTube channel, still very new. But I saw the space where I wanted to invest in the US stock market and I couldn't get a grasp on anyone that can talk about the US stock market from an Asian perspective. I saw the huge gap there. So I thought in, instead of really just waiting for that niche to pop up, why not I just be the pioneer in there? Just be the first person to let's talk about US stocks from an Asian's perspective, you know? Because when you were talking about taxation or everything from US perspective versus a Malaysian's perspective, it's completely different. They are talking about IRA. We are talking about EPF. No one on earth in Malaysia knows what's an IRA. So, and there was a lot of currency conversion and this kind of stuff, it's, it's very confusing for people like me, not just the audience, right? It was very confusing. So I saw the opportunity. I didn't knew it would grow so big, but I sort of knew that eventually people in Busan, Malaysia, they will sort of get tired in with the Malaysia's a stock market kind of scene because the, the real winners today are the brands that we all use, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Procter & Gamble, all these kind of big companies are all in the US. So it only makes sense for me to create something that has potential to grow and also the green space to grow. But I understand that today, US market in Malaysia's kind of perspective is still very foreign. Probably 9 out of 10 people across the street don't even know what US stock market, don't even know what is S&P 500. But to me, that's exciting. That's potential to reach out to more people and it's not a saturated space. So yeah, I think it, it's no ball from there. People like the perspective and it's a very small niche. So yeah, I grew from that niche. The topics that you talk about on your channel, obviously interactive brokers is a big chunk of it. Yeah. What, what else are you, or is it just about interactive brokers at the moment? So I, I would like to say that I'm a finance and investment channel. Sometimes I do a little bit analytics on the US macroeconomics and sometimes I do certain personal finance stuff, certain entrepreneurship kind of stuff. I also like to do a bit about taxation stuff because I realize no one is talking about tech stuff. It's very complicated and no one understands it. And then I, I don't understand it either, right? So I put, I really put myself in a very rocky shoot to really understand what the hell is dividend withholding tax, what the hell is capital gains tax. So I think the takeaway for your audience probably is, it, it probably could be a very hard topic, probably very wild niche that no one wants to talk about. But to me, that's business opportunities. Right. That's viewership potential. People want to learn, but people have no source to go to. You can be the source. You can be the one putting your ass off and working hard and grinding. And right. today, we, that's ChatGPT. Yeah. Three years ago when I was creating, or, or even two years ago, there wasn't, right. there's no ChatGPT. Right. Everything I was doing, right. and on top of my full-time job, I was doing 9 p.m. to about 4 a.m. And at the same time, I was doing two freelance jobs. 
So it was, you can say it's a four, four kind of four jobs at the same time. Freelance is doing what? So a little bit of my freelance, I was doing a little bit of a freelance video editing. And also I was doing freelance uh, Instagram page management kind of thing, creating content. Very simple stuff lah, but it brings me extra 1.5k a month, ringgit. It's not much, but three to four months down the road, I saved for a MacBook, I saved for a camera. It's more than enough for you to get started as a, I don't know, 1,000, 2,000 subscribers kind of base. And slowly that snowball, everything, yeah. Wow. Okay, what I got from you, you, you identified a gap in the market. So I think the best place when you want to find your niche or is like you search for something and then there's nobody explaining it the way you want it to be explained. And then you create that content. Correct. And I think that's the best way to, Correct. to, find, to find your slice of the pie of the internet there. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. Okay, so right now you doing this full time. Do you have a team? Like, can you ta- tell us a little bit about your team? So yeah, I have, I would say a small little team. Mostly are still freelancers, but I have a full time. So I have a small team of I think seven to eight people. Wow. So <laughs> yeah, I love them. All of them are really my babies. I work really closely with them. Mostly remotely, but sometimes I do meet them physically for some events or really just bonding that I don't show on the social media set, right? Malaysians, uh. Malaysians, they're all Malaysians, right? Because to me, like, I want to respect people and don't want to, like, really monetize and make content out of every single meetup that we do, right? So, so yeah, I have a small team. I have one, I would say, because I was working full-time, I wanted to hire, like, a clone of me that can think like me, want the same thing like me, and really can put the amount of effort that I'm putting, or if not slightly lesser, it's fine. Because people say if you can hire someone that can do probably 70% of the results that you want, that's the person that you need. So that person, she's like my social media manager. She's doing the content at the back end. She's also writing script, but she's also overlooking the other content writers. And we also do doing business development together, talking to sponsors, hiring people, this kind of stuff. So she's sort of like my jack of all trade and she's helping. She's my number two, you can say that. So if I'm not around, she can run the business for me. So to me, I think that's the beauty of really hiring people and it becomes a sustainable business. And I always tell people, yes, if one day touch wood, you know, I'm hospitalized, I can't create videos. Will I lose my revenue? No, because I have editors behind, writers behind. They can still do it for me. Probably not as fast and as I would like, right? But I will probably still able to sustain at least 40 to 50% of the income going forward. If I'm, you know, touch wood, have to be missing in action. So I think that's the beauty of having a small team or, or people that you can really trust and really help you with the things you do. So I have a social media manager. I have two content writers and also two more that is kind of new. So I'm sort of like a, you can say like an intern trial kind of thing. And then I have a digital marketer running ads and etc. Then I got a web developer, someone that's maintaining my website. Because for the love of God, I, I just can't do the website myself. <laughs> I have trouble adjusting all the containers, all the padding. Uh, it's a pain. Uh, so it's a full-time job kind of thing. I yes. can respect this guy can do this for, for full-time. It's a, it's a hard skill. It's hard it skill. is, it is. Yeah. Even though it's just WordPress, like drag and drop, it's still oh like, like I'm, I'm doing like three clients right now. I thought like, ah, easy peasy. Yeah. Like, oh, sh-. It's not. It, it looks easy. It looks easy. But even though it's drag and drop, it looks easy, but it's not. And even if you ace the computer kind of look, the iPad look, the phone look is totally different. Okay. So it's a lot of pain that I didn't want to go through. So, I mean, I had, I'm grateful to be in the uh, place where I can just pay people to do the job. And then, the, yeah, so that, that's the web dev guy. Then I also got a on-demand designer. I wouldn't say it's my team, but whenever I need any design jobs, I can get her to do it, of, of course, with a commission as well. So, yeah, I think that pretty much covers the seven to eight people that I'm working very closely. La. And of course, I got the two editors, one on-demand. One is sort of like already on a very fixed schedule, one video a week. The other person is also like on-demand, so two, two video editors, so probably seven to nine kind of people. Yeah. I think it's good that you, you kind of opened my mind also when it comes to hiring. I have a really bad experience with some managerial past, which kind of traumatized me a little bit about managing people or working with people. But I think you're right. If you pick the right people who value your work and, and on the same wavelength as you, it, it's going to be an enjoyable It is, moment. it is. The, the problem is if you work for somebody, like you, sometimes you cannot pick who your, your teams are. Of course. Right? So of course. you're not in the same wavelength and you're just butting heads all the time. It's just a toxic work environment. And of course, if you can add to that, right, hiring people is a skill. It's a really, you really need to develop the skill as an employer, as a hirer to really evaluate people. Um, it sounds rosy right now. I have a team of some very supportive kind of people, right? But I've went through hell. I've went through hiring the wrong people, evaluating the wrong way, really evaluating people based on paper, yeah. based on their first day interview. It's a huge no-no. Right. 
right. And yeah, I went through hell. We have hired more than 10 people. Maybe out of 10, probably six stayed until today. So it's a learning process. You might hire the wrong people and only realize it three months down the road. Yeah. It's normal. And it's, I, I think it's a part of the learning process to be an employer as well. You can't just hire the best talent at the best price on day one. Right. It's just totally impossible. So sometimes you may have to burn your cash to get really, quote unquote, for the lack of better words, shittier kind of work. But it is what it is. It's like an investment. You make bad trades, you make good trades. At the end of the day, as long as the good trades are more than the bad trades, I think it, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Good. Fantastic. That's something I also learned about hiring. <laughs> Funny thing is, I actually started earlier than you, right? But I am nowhere near in terms of YouTube where I want to be, right? So you looking at me, I'm kind of like doing all this. I'm all over the place. Like, what's your advice for people like me? Because I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people out there who's kind of similar boat. You know, they try here, try there, so they're not really one thing mm. because, you know, they're spreading themselves too thin. So what do you think? Considering that you were the one who were following me also on YouTube, yeah, firstly, yeah. like so. No, I think that's a very good question. I would actually ask the same question towards someone with 100,000, 200,000 subscribers. Obviously, 40,000 is okay average, not large, but not small also. So uh, I've been through the hell that you, are, you have just described, right? Really shifting every single thing for like 30 minutes just to get the right lighting and setups, everything. To me, that's the easy and the hard way. The hard way is really grinding through the hours that you put. I realize that the midnights that you're putting is not in vain. You need to know that the, the pains that you're going through, it's going to be worth it. Master everything that you're trying to deliver to your audience, be it audio, be it video, be it content researching, or really like interacting with your audience. I think the internet is like a wondrous place where it's just endless way to improve your thumbnail, your title, your every single thing. That also, and also I think one, one huge part would be capital allocation, how you allocate your money, how you use your money to reinvest into your kind of your business or your content creation workflow, right? Because yes, today you may have a set of equipment which is good. You can get the audio that probably people won't be able to realize if it's good or bad, if it's like average kind of audio. But you, to me, if you are... If you feel like you have done enough, you can always elevate that and be better than that. You can always go for more expensive mics. You can always go for more expensive cameras. You can always hire people. You can always look for better equipment. Really, I think even though people say, yes, you can do everything on phone, right? Which you can. You can start through a smartphone and upgrade with a simple mic. But there's a stark difference using a 15,000 ringgit camera, using a 5,000 ringgit mic. It, it might look overkill, but indirectly, subconsciously, people will think that this is professional. I loved it. I don't have anything to complain about the video and audio, and I can just focus on the content. And I, I think to me, it's not an overkill. To me, it's a sign of respect to the audience that I'm reallocating my budget. Whatever I've earned, I don't spend it as much. And reinvesting into the audience's pleasure to entertain them, to excite them. And then to, to, to me, I think the audience can see it. I started with a fork microphone, using a fork and a wireless mic. Just, just really crude and using really bad lightings. From there, I just kept on upgrading. To me, every single month, I want to buy something new. And in that sense, well, because I'm this in, in this investing kind of mindset, right, where I don't just see things as the price tag. If it's a 5,000 ringgit laptop, I'll make it worth 15,000 ringgit. My laptop is 17,000 ringgit. It might sound crazy today, 17,000 ringgit laptop, two terabytes, M1 Max Pro kind of a MacBook. It's crazy. But that 17,000 ringgit makes me 50K, 100K. Now that 17,000 means nothing. I would gladly buy five more of that if, if it can make me back the same return. So at the end of the day, money is just a, a price tag is just a number. So if you can reallocate that, if you earn 5K, try to put 3K back into the business. It might sound absurd. It might sound like you are spending dumb money on very diminishing return. But it's all those 1% at the audio, 1% at the lighting, 1% at the base of the voice, 1% at the lighting or the color or the color grading or the framing or the, you know, I don't know, every single thing, 1% adds up to the 10% that makes you stand out from everything else and that's where you elevate. But that is assuming that you are already making money. Yeah, yeah. But let's say somebody like me, from YouTube alone, I'm not really making that much money. So what do I got to do to bring myself up knowing, I mean, since you kind of know me online, yeah. what's your opinion? So two kind of context. I was not making any money. I was literally earning zero for one whole year before I even saw the single cent from YouTube. So I was funding myself from my own savings. I bought a, I think, 50 ringgit mic, bought a 
1,500 ringgit camera. It was all very basic equipment, but it was, it was all self-funded, and I, would, I wouldn't give an excuse for myself to not improve just because I earn very little. So that's one. But if you're really, like, really full-time doing this, or if you're jobless or whatever, right, for some reason, really be creative. You have to be creative. Really using blankets as a sound isolation kind of thing, or using A4 papers to diffuse or lighting, this kind of thing, you have to be creative with limited resources, which is a great thing. No one, no one knows the kind of ugliness that you put onto equipment as long as the result is pleasing to them. How you learn how to edit your post audio, that's free, but you just have to put the time to go and learn to edit the audio at the post, right? It takes a long time to adjust the treble, the wave sound. No one knows, man. The audience doesn't care. Right. They just want clean audio. Right. So 500 ringgit microphone, if you know how to edit, it can sound like a 2,000 ringgit microphone. Right. But of course, you have to go through the process of really understanding wavelengths, this kind of thing. So there are really a lot of things to learn. Money is just a shortcut for you to like skip past all of that. But really, if you don't have the resource of money, learn the technical skills behind it. Understand lighting. Lighting is just physics. Sound is just physics. How you place your microphone, how you do isolation padding, your, your vocal control, everything. So yeah, it's, it's an entire kind of ecosystem to me. And I'm, I'm a tech nerd, so I really enjoy doing all of this, yeah. Okay, cool, cool. All right, so final question. So let's say somebody new, right? Like they're kind of like they're inspired with your journey and you're, what, what's your one advice for them? I will say if, if there's anyone asking me whether they can make money or whether they can break through in this content creation kind of business or whatever, right? You can, anyone can be a content creator. You have a smartphone, if you can speak, if you can't speak, I'm an introvert, I can't speak. I can't speak like today. And five years down the road, I know I will laugh at myself today. But it's fine, you have to start somewhere and you don't want to think about money. The moment you started your journey with money, you are doomed to fail. Nine out of 10 people probably fail because they think about money. How can they monetize with 50 subscribers? How can they monetize with 150 subscribers? No, you don't think about money. Because to me, money is just a function of value. The more value you can pump out to people, the more value it will come back to you. It's a two-way street. It's like thermodynamics, you know? Energy, yeah. <laughs> you can't create energy, but because you are already in the flywheel system where you are churning out energy for people, then the energy will come back to you. It might not be 100% kind of, you know, a return, right? But it will come back to you, and you would ideally want to think about monetization somewhere down the larger sizing of, let's say, YouTube is probably one to 2,000 subscribers above. Then you start to think of monetizing to keep yourself sustainable, but not too greedy about the profits. Because at the end of the day, when your sizing is small and you think about monetizing, you will hurt your brand if the brand, if the sponsors of the products that you are placing does not directly help people. Because there's a reason why brands want to advertise, because their own brands wouldn't work so well on Facebook ads or wouldn't work so well on billboard or newsletter or whatever, right? So that's why they need your help. But if you are so hard sell to want to monetize for 500 ringgit, 1,000 ringgit, yeah, some, I said to, it's sad to say that you are doomed to fail. So don't think about money, think about the value you can provide to people. Be great at what you do, money will come to you one day, wow. very fast. Wow. And it will come to you when you least unexpected it. Oh, very good, yeah. very good. So just create, right? Just create and just keep going at it, give value mm -hmm. without expecting anything in return first. Yes, and you see, there's, I mean, in this finance niche, we see a lot of real estate agents, they started creating YouTube channel because they want to market the properties that they're trying to sell which is fine, some of them got 150 subscribers, 500 views, but that's not enough. Imagine if you just talk about the properties you love, you just visit your friend's properties, you just share about what you learn about building materials, what you learn about different real estate developers, maybe from there you got 2,000 subscribers because you're genuine, you're not selling anything. Maybe from there you get 5,000, 10,000 views. Then from there onwards, you take a small job from a real estate developer, you start selling things, you can make way more when you are at a slightly higher niche, and the return is compounding. It's not a flat line. So don't think that at 500 subscribers, you can earn 500 ringgit, and then at 10,000 subscribers, you can earn 10K. It's very different. Maybe at 500, you are probably earning 500 ringgit, but at 10,000, probably you're earning 20,000 ringgit. So the return is it's, 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 it's crazy. People just don't see the return far long enough. People are always focused on the short term. Great, thank you very much for that. I think that is that should wrap up the this episode. Thank you again for coming all the way over here and sharing your story. I'm pretty sure this will be very inspiring to a lot of other content creators out there, especially if you're not from the US, in Malaysia specifically. So uh, he's the living proof that you can do it, especially here in Malaysia. So once again, this is Ziet Invest. Thank you very much. Okay, see, see you guys. Bye-bye.